For question period, the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Education. We are joined here today, today by so many passionate activists and parents of the Ontario Autism Coalition, and I hope everyone in the House will take the time to read the report they released today, because they highlighted some very important problems in our system. For instance, we know that 79 per cent of school boards say they spend more money on special education than they receive from the province. And because of that, there are certain needs, there are certain special education needs that, that are, frankly aren't funded by this government. And we need accountability for those special education dollars to make sure no child is left behind. Mr. Speaker, will the government commit to a full and transparent review Question. of the special education funding formula? Thank you, Speaker, and uh, I want to thank the member opposite for the question, and I want to um, just say that uh, we are working with the Ontario Autism Coalition. Um, they are participating in the uh, Ontario Autism uh, Program Committee. I've met with that committee. I've met with uh, members of the coalition, as has uh, the Minister of Children and Youth Services. And we are investing in supports uh, to children who have autism and, uh, and who have that uh, particular exceptionality, Mr. Speaker. Um, our investments in special education is $2.7 billion, and uh, while there there are many needs that uh, that are in place in our school boards. There is always more that we can do, Mr. Speaker, and we're constantly working That's together it. with our partners, with our stakeholders, like no the Ontario Autism Coalition, to provide the best education possible for all students in Ontario. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Minister of Education, I did not get an answer to the real challenge we have that <coughs> school boards have to spend more on special education than they receive in funding from the province. There's a cost to this. Because of this government's continuous failure to support children with autism, we hear story after story of children who are left behind. For example, six-year-old Carter from Coburg. Carter is on the severe end of the spectrum. He is nonverbal and using a communicative device and, and is a flight risk. He requires constant support. But in September, his family was told they were going to lose their highly trained education assistant. Wow. Carter's family fought back and Carter got to keep his EA, but it was after an emotional, an emotional push by the family. Mr. Speaker, will Carter and his family have to do this every September? Can't we have the support for these children? Thank you, Speaker. And uh, you know we are continuously uh, providing more supports uh, for children with autism in our schools. We have 20,000 students so. who have autism uh, in our schools, Mr. Speaker. In fact, uh, let me uh, just inform uh, the leader of the opposition that uh, students with autism are moving on uh, to post-secondary post education at four times uh, the numbers that, that they were, Mr. Speaker. So we are ensuring that all, all students in our schools that have excess, exceptionalities and especially students with autism receive the supports that they need. We have trained over 30,000 education workers and teachers in ABA uh, so that, uh, that those supports are available in the classroom, Mr. Speaker. There are also investments in specialized Answer. supports for students so that they receive the supports that they need in our schools. Thank you. No supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Minister of Education, and I will repeat, special education funding does not meet the demand. There are children in this province that are being left behind. Here's another example. Uh, I've got to hear a, a note, a, a story from uh, Melanie's son from Niagara Falls. Melanie wrote us and said that despite clear paperwork stating that her son needed one-to-one -one support, he wasn't given the proper help he needed. And you know what happened on World Autism Day in 2012? Instead of being given the support he deserved, Melanie's son was suspended from school. The school board told Melanie that there is no money to provide them what he requires. His son wasn't welcome at school. Mr. Speaker, can the minister tell Melanie why there is no money to have the proper education and the proper academic Question. experience for her son? It's not right. Deputy, Deputy Premier. Thank you. 
Thank you, Speaker. And uh, the Leader of the Opposition is raising some very important issues, but I think it is important to remind him and others that when he was a federal MP, when he was in Ottawa, he actually voted right. against creating a national autism strategy. Order. Start the clock. Minister. The member was presented with a bill in the House of Commons to provide for the development of a national strategy for the treatment of autism, and he voted against this bill. Act. He said no to children across the country who have autism. He said no to their parents. He said no to expanding access to IDI and ABI. Today he stands Thank in you. the legislature being a champion. Order, please. I would advise against it. Yep. Unless it's unknown, there should be no other noise making in this house. New question, the Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, uh, my question is for the Minister of Education. The natural inclination of this government, when they're embarrassed of their own position, when they can't defend their own position, they attack others. Now, today, the Ontario. The clock. It would be helpful if I didn't hear anything from that side so I could go after the other side. Leader. Mr. Speaker, the Ontario Autism Coalition report released today had this to say. I quote from the report, teacher candidates should graduate knowing they will work regularly with students with exceptionalities and they should embrace this opportunity rather than fear it or avoid it. But this government has neglected to support these future teachers. Question. Need. Mr. Speaker, why had this government not done more to prepare young teachers for the realities of Ontario classrooms? Please, can we have an answer on the report, not another drive-by attack? Mr. Speaker, um, we actually have, as part of our, our two-year curriculum in Teachers College, mandatory content on special needs and exceptionalities. But, Mr. Speaker, for the Leader of the Opposition to stand in this legislature claiming to be a champion of parents and children with autism, when he had an opportunity to help those students, and he said no. He said no to children and to families to develop a national strategy for children with autism, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the member opposite show, only shows interest in parents and children with autism when he can use it as a part of his political ambitions, Mr. Speaker. And that is wrong, Mr. Speaker. That is absolutely wrong Answer. because we know that children with autism deserve the best possible education in our province, and that's exactly what we're working on, Mr. Speaker. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker. Prescott Russell, come to order. Carry on. Mr. Speaker, back to the Minister of Education. The Minister seems oblivious to the fact that they are in government. They have a record that they should be embarrassed of. They have a record where they took families with children with autism to court. They can't defend their own record, so they choose to throw smear. Right. Children deserve better than this pathetic answer. Now, the reality is, the reality is Mr. Speaker, not even the teachers of this province believe that you're providing the necessary supports. That, here's an example. The Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario said there is a critical lack of support for children with significant behavioural issues. Sam Hammond from ETFO said many of these students are suffering and we need to step up and help them. 
Sam Hammond is right. We need to provide support. This spin that the government is saying they are providing training, Question. the union says the exact opposite is happening. We need support for these children. Here, here. We need support for our teachers. Will this government stop abandoning them? Thank you. A member from Etobicoke North, come to order. Mr. Speaker, here's our record. Since 2003, we have increased funding for special education needs in this province by 70 per cent, Mr. Speaker. $2.7 billion to support special education. Seated, please. The member from the and Carleton will withdraw. Yes. Finish, Minister. Mr. Speaker, there are more EAs in, our, in Ontario schools than ever before, an increase of over 6,300 or 37 per cent, including 900 more EAs since 2013. Mr. Speaker, over the past decade, we have invested $77 million to Answer. strengthen our school capacity and improving the learning environment for students with autism who are welcome in our schools, who are welcome in our classrooms, and who are doing better. Mr. Mr. Speaker, there's more work to be done, and that's exactly what we're doing. Thank you. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Minister of Education. This government has no reason to be proud of their record, and frankly, you wouldn't have seen hundreds and hundreds of families with a child with autism protesting at Queen's Park right. if this record was one that they could be proud of. Right. They wouldn't have taken these families to court if they were proud Same of their record. Right. Frankly, this government's uh, record on helping families with autism has been shameful. Now, Mr. Speaker, Sam Hammond, on behalf of the teachers, also said this. He said too many children, a lot of them as young as four or five, are languishing on long wait lists for vital early interventions. Interventions they need. These include assessments that would give them access to supports. But even them, many, many of the resources are simply inadequate and will not meet the growing demand. That's what ETFO had to say. Question. So you have the family saying it's inadequate, you have the teacher saying it's adequate. Yep. The only only person in this province saying that what they're doing is adequate is the minister. Thank Do you. the right thing, support the Please. 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 Thank you. Minister. Deputy Premier. Deputy Deputy Speaker. Premier. Thank you, Speaker. You know, the member opposite uh, uh, talks about our record. I'd like to talk about his record, Speaker. Yeah. His, voting record. his voting record in Ottawa, it's in black and white. He can look it up himself. Anybody can. He voted against creating a national autism strategy. He might not even remember doing that, Speaker, but I can tell you that he voted against a bill to provide for the development of a national strategy for the treatment of autism. He decided to vote against this bill. He said no to those kids that he claims to champion today. He said no to those parents he claims to champion today, Speaker. Once again, we see him standing in the legislature. When we compare what he says today with how he voted in the past, Speaker, I think he has some explaining yes, to do about his record. Thank you. New question, the leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the acting premier. Hydro One's um, applying to increase the cost of delivery by nearly 20 per cent, at the same time as they give senior executives massive raises, including a 500 per cent increase for the CEO. Does the Acting Premier think this is right, Speaker? Thank you. <laughs> Minister, of Energy. Premier, Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. When it comes to the Hydro One rate application, Mr. Speaker, um, we, we've recognized that we're going to be holding all of our uh, increases, Mr. Speaker, to the rate of inflation. So when we have our Fair Hydro plan coming into effect, Mr. Speaker, our government is lowering those bills by 25 per cent, and we will ensure that we achieve this reduction no matter the outcome of this application, Mr. Speaker. In fact, Hydro One's rural customers will be seeing even greater reductions from our Fair Hydro Plan, Mr. Speaker. 
They will be, will be expanding the support to those customers facing some of the highest delivery costs in the province, Mr. Speaker, including Hydro One's rural customers. They will be seeing, Mr. Speaker, a reduction between 40 and 50 percent on their bills, Mr. Speaker. That is significant for those families, Mr. Speaker. So we will achieve this, as we said, no matter the outcome of this application, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Well, Hydro One is applying for a nearly 20 percent increase while they give their senior executives multi-million dollar raises. Shame. The Liberals promised that privatizing Hydro One would mean lower bills, Speaker. That promise was total nonsense. Hydro bills are sky high and still rising. Hydro One is applying for delivery cost increases of nearly 20 per cent. Will the Liberal government do what is right, stop the sell-off of Hydro One today, and stop rewarding executives for jacking up hydro bills? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, let's talk about what this executive has done with Hydro One over the last year, Mr. Speaker. They've actually saved, Mr. Speaker, $60 million, Mr. Speaker. And that leads directly back to ratepayers, Mr. Speaker, by lowering bills. They've also given customer choice with billing cycles, helping them to better manage their bills, Mr. Speaker. They've introduced e-billing, working towards mobile billing as well, Mr. Speaker. They ended the practice of security deposits for new customers. Customers. And of course, Mr. Speaker, introducing a voluntary ban on winter disconnections, Mr. Speaker. So that is something that they've done. It they've become a customer-focused business, Mr. Speaker. And we've also seen through our Fair Hydro plan and working with Hydro One a 40 to 50 percent reduction, Mr. Speaker, that will be seen for all of our rural and northern communities, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. Anyone can see that the privatization of Hydro One has been a disaster, Speaker. According to the FAO, it's in increasing the province's debt. It means bills are much higher and delivery cost increases are going to uh, go up by 20 per cent, all to pay for bigger executive paychecks and shareholder profits. Yep. This is exactly why, Speaker, 80 per cent of the people of Ontario want to keep Hydro One public. Will the government admit that this has been a huge mistake and stop the privatization before it's too late? Here, here. Crusader, please. Crusader, please. Thank you. Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The criticism uh, of the NDP's obsession with Hydro One um, just doesn't come from us, Mr. Speaker. There's also many others out there, like Com Tim Kaladze of the Globe and Mail calls the belief that ownership of utilities in Ontario affects rates as one of the biggest misconceptions about electricity, Mr. Speaker. Martin Reg Cohns agrees that Hydro One can only charge that the OEB deems reasonable, and even Brady Yach, an economist at the Consumer Policy Institute, Mr. Speaker, and a frequent government critic, calls the idea that privatization increases rates a straw man, Mr. Speaker. One of the things that we will continue to do on this side of the House, Mr. Speaker, is invest in this province by building infrastructure, by building roads, by building bridges, something that they would not do, Mr. Speaker, because they have no idea how to pay for it. Just like their plan on electricity, Mr. Speaker, it's pie in the sky. We have a plan that works, we have a system that's working, and we're building infrastructure in Ontario. Thank you. Your question, the leader of the third party. Speaker, my next question is also for the acting premier. The premier said. Uh, sorry, the Premier and the Liberal government took no time at all to sign off on nearly $5 million salary for the CEO of Hydro One, but the government has spent two years trying to figure out if a working mom should be able to take a sick day without losing a day's pay, or worse, being fired. Can the government explain why the CEO of Hydro One gets a 500 per cent raise, but people in Ontario could still be fired for getting sick? Thank you. Deputy Premier. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And, and when it comes to our agency executive compensation, our government strongly <laughs> believes in ensuring that 
public salaries are fair to employees, Mr. Speaker, but also reasonable um, to the public purse, Mr. Speaker. And this just isn't talk. We've demonstrated this commitment time and again. And that's why we froze all salaries across the broader public sector in 2012, Mr. Speaker. And, and that's why we've implemented a new framework designed to test the fairness of, of public salaries. And Ontario is now approaching the end of the planned salary freeze, but we're continuing to keep a strict, uh, strict eye on our agencies, Mr. Speaker, and salaries will remain frozen until agencies comply with our framework. Just like we did with the colleges, Mr. Speaker, we're going to send agencies back to the drawing board if we're not satisfied. And this includes agencies within my ministry, Mr. Speaker. Work is underway to ensure that these frameworks and the remaining agencies have to comply. Thank you. Supplementary. There is no reason a woman should take home less pay than a man doing the same work. That's right. People should be able to have their work schedule so that they can plan their lives. People who are employees should be recognized as employees with the rights that come along with that. And after two years of study, nobody knows where the Liberals stand. It's a stark contrast to 500 per cent raises for Hydro One CEOs and $11 million in pay for just five well-heeled executives at the new privatized Hydro One. Can the acting premier explain to people why her and her government's priority is million-dollar raises for the bosses at Hydro One, while everyone else is still waiting for action on minimum wage and decent jobs. Thank you. You say that, please. You say that, please. Minister. Minister of Labour. Minister of Labour. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the honourable member for the question. Certainly, there are a number of issues that are facing the workplaces in Ontario today, Speaker, and this government is meeting them head on. Never in the history of this province has anybody ever looked at the Employment Standards Act and the Labour Relations Act at the same time, Speaker. We've gone out and done that, Speaker. We've talked with organized labour. We've talked with business. Yes, we've talked with advocates. We've talked with employees themselves. We've talked with people as to how we should close the gender wage gap. I don't think there's a person in this House, Speaker, that realizes that doesn't realize that the gender wage gap unfairly disadvantages women across Ontario no, and across board. every other jurisdiction, Speaker. Yeah. This applies to government agencies, to this applies to government itself, and it applies to private sector Part and the, the non-profit. Speaker, we're prepared to take these issues head-on, Speaker. We've got Answer. a group that's advising us on the gender wage gap, Speaker. You'll have a wrap-up in a moment. Finish, please. Speaker, there's people that like to talk about this issue. This government's going to do something about it. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, for 14 years, the quality of work has steadily eroded under this government's watch. Steadily. Temp agencies have proliferated under this government's watch here in Ontario. You know what, Speaker? Governing is about priorities. Ontarians are concerned to see that the Liberal priority, once again, is a few powerful people at the top, and regular families are waiting for answers and waiting for answers again. Will the government start getting the basics right? Stop the raises for Hydro One executives and raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour. Minister of Labour. Speaker, the minimum wage in the province of Ontario has been pegged to inflation for a number of years now. Speaker, we went out and we talked to people. We talked to the people in the province of Ontario. We talked to business. We talked to labour. We talked to poverty advocates. We talked to those people. Everybody. We talked to those people who represent people exactly. that are living at the lower income level. Speaker, and we asked them what is the best process to put in place to ensure that the minimum wage in the province of Ontario keeps pace with inflation. The speaker, they one? gave us advice. They said, Stony Creek. they said set they said set the minimum wage rate in April of the year, Speaker. Correct. Introduce it in October. Right. Advocates wanted advocates certainty. wanted certainty. 
They wanted security. Business wanted flexibility, Speaker. We stood up for people that earn minimum wage in the province of Ontario. Exactly. At a time when they were needed the most, the NDP sat on their hands did and nothing. did nothing for the people in the province of Ontario. Yes, sir. Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. New question, the member from Dufferin County. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Education. We've all heard about the challenges students with autism face when they transition into school. They sit on a waiting list for a psychological assessment to get their individualized education plan, or IEP, and even with an IEP, they wait for an educational assistant to support them in the classroom. In a report released today, the Ontario Autism Coalition recommends a review of special education. Will the minister commit to reviewing special education funding to ensure students with exceptionalities get the help they need? Mr. Speaker, uh, first off, I'd like to thank the Ontario Autism Coalition for their continued advocacy when it comes to autism services in Ontario and for children with special needs. Mr. Speaker, I, I want to thank them. And you know, Mr. Speaker, our government is moving forward with investments in autism services, and uh, the advice that we receive from the Autism uh, Advisory Committee, of which the uh, Ontario Autism Coalition is a member of, is greatly appreciated, and we want to ensure that we strengthen our schools for children with special needs, Mr. Speaker, and that's exactly what we are doing. In 2016, we announced that we'd be investing an additional $500 million to improve autism services in Ontario, and this school year, school boards are receiving more than $2.7 billion Answer. to support students with special education needs. Mr. Speaker, Absolutely, there is more to be done, and that's exactly what we're focused Thank you. on. Thank you. Minister, there is no doubt that the Ontario Autism Coalition is doing excellent work, but they are now looking to you for action. There are currently 20,000 students with autism attending Ontario public schools. We all know that autism doesn't end at five, and it certainly doesn't end at school. Will the minister commit to reviewing how special education funding is being used in our schools to, as recommended by the Ontario Autism Coalition? Mr. Speaker, it's, it's very difficult to listen to the opposition to give advice on education, Mr. Speaker, when they left it in a complete mess. Mr. Speaker, we know that more needs to be done for students with special needs, and that's why we have constantly increased our support. In fact, we've invested $77 million to strengthen school capacity in improving the learning environment for students with autism. We have 20,000 students with autism in our school boards, Mr. Speaker. As I have said, many of them, four times as many, Mr. Speaker, are moving on to post-secondary education and on to their life. Just this morning, Mr. Speaker, um, the member from Etobicoke Lakeshore and the member from Kingston and the Islands and I, we were out at Silver Creek, Mr. Speaker, in a, an environment that is supporting students with special yes, needs, uh, learning um, with special education needs, including autism, and we see the great support that they're receiving in their communities, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. We are going to continue to do more. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. New question, the member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Acting Premier. Yesterday, we learned that tenants in Liberty Village have been told by their landlord that they could either pay double their current rent or move out by July 1st. Oh, After re receiving this outrageous rent increase, notice one tenant said, I didn't even know it was legally possible. Right. Yes, this is legally possible because of a loophole in the Residential Tenancies Act that allows landlords of rentals built after 1991 to raise the rent to whatever they want. Will the Premier do the right thing and close this loophole as the NDP has proposed? Thank you. Deputy Premier. To the Minister of Community and Social Services. Sir, Community and Social Services. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, our colleague, the Minister of Housing, did address uh, this type of a question yesterday. And so we do, on this side of the House, find it absolutely unacceptable that so many Ontarians are faced with housing costs 
uh, that continue to rise dramatically. And as he said, this is exactly why we are developing a plan to address unfair rises in rental costs by delivering substantive rent control reform in Ontario as part of an ongoing review of the Residential Tenancies Act. Uh, the ministry has, in fact, consulted very broadly on this, and uh, we have a number of initiatives that we've also taken uh, in the last couple Answer. of years. And so I will address more of that in the supplementary. Thank, Thank you, Mr. You. Speaker. Supplementary. Speaker, back to the acting premier. Housing policy should be about providing homes for people, not profits for investors. But for the last 14 years, this government has put investors first by letting some landlords raise the rent to whatever they want. This loophole gives investors an easy way to evict tenants whenever they need a unit for a quicker sale. All tenants deserve the same rent protection, including tenants in Liberty Village. Will the acting premier, will the premier close this rent control loophole? Thank you. Minister. <laughs> Well, of course, uh, our government has taken really substantial action in a number of different are areas over the last few years. We've been working with our municipal partners to make secondary suites a quick way to provide affordable housing in our communities, passing inclusionary zoning legislation that will empower municipalities to require the construction of affordable units in new residential developments, freezing the municipal property tax on apartment buildings to provide relief to renters, doubling the maximum refund for first-time home buyers, etc. Now, of course, we do need to recall that uh, uh, the third party was in government from 91 to 95, and I don't recall yeah. that they took right. any action That's in right. relation to this member's private Four member's years. bill. Thank yeah. you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Your question, the member from Northumberland, Quickie West. Well, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care, Speaker. Great, Minister. Wow. I know health care is a top priority for our government, providing all Ontarians with timely access to care they need, whether at home, in their community, or in an outstanding hospital. Hospitals is of the utmost importance to our government, but also to me as a member from Northumberland Queenie West. I know our government increased funding for health care by $1 billion this year, including investing $485 million in our hospitals to improve access to care. Because of the investment like these, our government has reduced wait times for surgeries, increased the number of Ontarians who have health care providers, and we have expanded access to services for Ontarians across the province. In fact, just last week, the Canadian Institute for Health Information released a report identifying this progress. Can the Minister Question. of Health and Long-Term Care please inform this House on some of the important progress the government is making on reducing wait times? Thank you, oh, yeah. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, first of all, uh, my mom and my dad, uh, Bill and Jean Hoskins, are watching today. It's my dad's 89th birthday. Hey. Hey. Last week was my mom's birthday as well. And uh, I just wanted to give them that shout out and say happy birthday. Uh, but Mr. Speaker, the Kai Hai report from last week confirms that Ontario is making great progress on reducing wait times. 85% of hip replacements in this province are completed within the medical benchmark. That's 6% better than the national average. 81% of knee replacements in Ontario are completed within the medical benchmark. That's 12% better than the national average. And 99% of radiation therapy begins within the medical benchmark, again, the best in all of Canada. And the report also notes that Ontario has the lowest wait times for MRI and CAT scans in the entire country. Wow. This is Answer. important progress, Mr. Speaker, and I wanted to share that with the Legislature and Ontarians today. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for setting the record straight in this House. I know health care is a top priority for a government, and I have witnessed firsthand in my riding the positive impact their health care investments are making, such as an additional $2.88 million dollars this year to Campbell Memorial Hospital, Northumberland House Hospital and Quinty Healthcare Corporation. Mr. Speaker, I know that this isn't the first time that our government has been recognized for improving wait times and for leading Canada when it comes to beating wait times targets. Unfortunately, both opposition parties continue to spread misinformation about our health care system, especially in rural Ontario. Can the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care please remind this House 
of the findings from a Fraser report on wait times that was released just a few months ago. Question, Minister. Do those third-party reports, scientific and evidence-based, are so important for us to understand the progress that we're making? The Fraser report uh, indicated just several months ago that Ontario has the shortest wait times from GP to specialist in the entire country. In fact, about 25 percent shorter than the national average. We also have the second shortest wait times from specialist to treatment, Mr. Speaker, 20 percent shorter than the national average. And on average, Ontarians are receiving care more than four weeks earlier than what uh, happens across this country. We have the shortest total wait times in Canada, the shortest wait time for a CT scan, for an ultrasound, an MRI. And in just one year, from 2015 to 2016, wait times for general surgery have gone down by a further 13 percent, wait times for medical oncology yes, 39 percent faster, and elective cardiovascular surgery 36 percent faster, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Your question, the member from Hill. Thank you very much, and my question is to the Minister of Children and Youth. Today, the Ontario Coalition for Autism released its report to improve outcomes for students with autism in Ontario schools. Like so many parents of children with autism from across Ontario, they are also worried about the specifics of the new autism program, so worried that they're speaking out in the media. Tanya Corey, a parent from Ottawa, says that she's scared and doesn't trust the government. No. Parents need information about the new program so that they can plan. Mr. Speaker, what is the minister going to tell Tanya and other parents of autistic kids to convince them to trust our government to do what is in their child's best interest? Thank you, Minister of Children and Children and Youth Services. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member uh, for the question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm quite proud of the direction we're going uh, in as a government when it comes to supporting families with children with autism. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we're going to implement a new plan, and within that new plan, we'll create 16. 1,000 new spaces. Uh, we'll increase the amount of spaces for ABA during the transition period. Um, as the member notes last week uh, during my statement, I said anyone who's actually receiving funding today, uh, transition funding, will continue to receive that funding until the new program is put in place. Mr. Speaker, this is a program um, that I believe all members in this House can be proud of. We have uh, the best supported program in the entire country, if not North America. It's something we should be proud of, and I will be sending out a correspondence to uh, parents right across Ontario, yes, like I did months ago, uh, to ensure that they understand exactly what that transition will look like. Thank, Thank you. you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Julie Bridgen drove all the way here from Brant today. Her son has been improperly restrained at school, left unsupervised at times, and once her son was even found locked in a computer lab in the dark. Unfortunately, the school board won't allow her son's IBI therapist to provide any help in the classroom. Will the minister show compassion and offer Julie's son the support that he needs and not make them wait for the plan to be revealed? They need the support now. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I've been uh, very clear that I will be communicating uh, different elements uh, within the plan, but in June we will be launching a brand new plan. Mr. Speaker, I was at City Hall yesterday with uh, advocates, uh, with parents, with city councillors, and one of the speakers got up and talked about building a national strategy across this country. And Mr. Speaker, it is incredible to stand in this legislature and have the Leader of the Opposition stand and ask these questions when he had an opportunity to support a national plan a decade ago. And he failed our students. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Member from Weldon. 
Uh, my question is to the Acting Premier. Today I was joined by three young workers, uh, some in the gallery today, from different sectors here at Queen's Park to talk about the urgent need for better jobs, uh, better wages and better benefits. They talked to me about how hard it was to organize, to join a union and to get a first contract once there. So today I'm introducing a bill that will do just that, a bill that will go a long way to making sure that people in this province have the protections that they need to sec secure stable jobs. These young workers echoed the message I hear every day across the province, people who are concerned about how unstable their working conditions are. Will this government do the right thing and make sure that Ontario workers have access to better and fairer uh, process to join a union and to get a first contract once they're there. Thank you, Deputy Premier. To the Minister of Labour. Minister of Labour. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, about two years ago, Speaker, we started a very important conversation in the province. We talked to families, we talked to businesses, we talked to uh, we talked to organized labour, and it was about what work had become in the province of Ontario and what it should be, Speaker. And Speaker, the NDP this morning called this process a waste of time. And Speaker, I just could not agree with that anymore, Speaker. Speaking with workers, speaking with families, speaking with organized labor, speaking with unions, speaking with business, Speaker, is never a waste of time, Speaker. Speaker, it's been over 25 years since we looked at the Employment Standards Act, which we looked at the Labor Relations Act, which governs, Speaker, how you join your union, what rules what rules are associated with the joining of unions? Speaker, for the past two years, we've had a conversation Answer. with the people of Ontario. We'll be bringing forward the report in the very near future. Speaks to exactly what the NDP is talking about. They're a little Thank late you. to the party on this one, Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. I think the workers are ready for some doing, not some talking. Yeah. Speakers across Ontario have not seen improvements to the legislation in over two decades, 14 years of which the Liberals have been in uh, power, and they've done nothing to date. New Democrats Alex. value public consultation, but the public has Alex. been clear on these issues for years. So clear, in fact, that the government's federal counterparts also agree, and they already have legislation tabled. We've seen how quickly the government was willing to claw back emergency leave days for non-union workers in the auto sector through regulation, and we saw how quickly the government was willing to move for Alice Dawn. So why isn't the government moving just as quickly for the workers in this province? Will this government do the right thing today and make sure that workers get a better and fairer access to join a union and get a first Question. contract arbitration once they're there? Thank you. Minister. Speaker, the changing workplaces review, Speaker, is foundational to some of the changes that the member talks about. Speaker, the issues that have been raised obviously are things like scheduling, things like um, things like the ability to join a union, things about the conditions that precarious workers are vulnerable workers face when they find themselves with temporary help agencies, Speaker. Hours of work, pay, vacation pay non-enforcement of employment standards. These are all the issues that are being addressed by the Changing Workplace Review. Speaker, I have the final report now uh, from the special advisors. We're going to review it. We're going to consider the recommendations. It's got to be translated. It's got to be made accessible, Speaker. But now, three weeks or four weeks before the, re the release of the report, the NDP suddenly finds religion on these issues, Speaker. We've been working on this for years, Speaker. And it, yes, it's, uh, it's something that, Speaker, I look forward to bringing to this House, to discussing these important issues, because they really affect precarious and vulnerable. Thank you. New question, the member from Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Recently, Ontario held its first-ever cap-and-trade auction. The results of this historic auction are now in, and it shows that 100 per cent of the allowances that were available have been sold. Strong 
Strong participation means industry is engaged and is on board our efforts to reach our emission reduction targets. It also means that we can and we will continue to make progress when it comes to investing in green projects. The true mark of success, however, is going to be reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. By working alongside other jurisdictions in the Western Climate Initiative, Ontario is committed to achieving the highest amount of emission reductions at the lowest possible cost. Speaker, could the minister please explain Question. to the House what the latest results of Ontario's cap-and-trade auction mean? Yeah, minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Thanks, um, Mr. Speaker, the auction raised uh, just over $471 million, which goes into programs. It, um, it also kept the price of transition very low at $18.08, .08, which is very important. It doesn't matter where you sit, I can still hear you. Finish, please. Speaker. And there's something called the, the, the Hirschenfeld uh, evaluation, which tells us what the level of participation is. And we had strong participation from all sectors of the economy. So we're probably looking at 80 percent up of participation, which is one of the highest, which means there is big buy-in from business across Ontario wow. to participate in the market. And, sir, thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. I'd like to thank the minister for his response. It's promising to hear that the province is engaging industry in an effort to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. It's also promising to learn that we're building bridges with other jurisdictions in the global effort to tackle climate change. Ontario's cap-and-trade auction was administered by the Western Climate Initiative. This is a nonprofit organization that develops strict oversight rules in the carbon market which the opposition has publicly stated it would opt out of. Speaker, climate change knows no boundaries, so a united front, as exemplified by the members of the WCI, is needed to make real progress in this effort. Speaker, could the minister please talk to this House about the next steps involved in Ontario's climate change efforts? Question. Thank you, Minister. Thanks, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thanks to the member. So, the Pemina Institute, very well regarded, says that for every million dollars invested in energy and home retrofits generates three to four million dollars, Mr. Speaker, in additional economic activity. So our $2.5 billion program would create $7.5 to $10 billion in investment in business activity. It would also, according to Pemina, create 13, 13 jobs for every million dollars, which if you do the math is a minimum of 33,000 jobs, Mr. Speaker. One of the biggest job creations. It will also, Pemina estimates, cut home heating costs on average by 50 per cent, Mr. Wow. Speaker. We'll say that again. Pemina estimates that a retrofitted home costs about 50 per cent less to heat. Answer. So what the opposition is going to do is jack that $18 to $74, tear up all of those programs, cancel $18 billion, and leave Thank homeowners you. with high bill and no Thank you. And of course, the member from Lifting Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Children and Youth Services. The Grandview Children's Centre is the only treatment centre in Durham Region where children and youth with special needs and disabilities receive the therapy they need. Does the Minister know how many children are on the wait list for services at Grandview? Thank you. Minister of Children and Youth Services. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I'd like to thank the member for uh, the question. Uh, Ontario Children's uh, Treatment Centres provide rehabilitation services for children and youth with special needs and families. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, since 2008-2009, we've uh, continued to make investments in these areas. In fact, Mr. Speaker, we've invested over $312 million in capital funding for treatment centres uh, here in the province of Ontario since 2008-2009. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Grandview is an important uh, place uh, for families in the Durham region. I've had the opportunity to go out there and meet with parents, and um, they have a full commitment from this government that we're going to look for ways through a process we have here in government. Uh, to make capital investment. There's an application and a process that's, that's in play, and we're going to uh, ensure that we follow um, uh, the process yes, in order to uh, ensure that we're delivering the best types of programs for our young people here in the province of Ontario. Thank you. Supplementary. Yes. 
Uh, speaker, back to the minister. Minister, almost 3,000 children Whoa. in Durham almost Region 3, are waiting to service, receive services at Grandview. Because Grandview is waiting to expand, families and children with special needs are not receiving the services they desperately need. Speaker, the town of Ajax has donated the land for Grandview's new treatment center. The Grandview Foundation has raised over $8 million from the community. But for nine years, Speaker, nine years, and after multiple ministers, this government has yet to commit the necessary funds to the Grandview Children's Center. What are you waiting for, Minister? Will you support the expansion of Grandview Children's Center now so that the families and children with special needs in Durham Region get the help they need? Thank you. Could you say it, please? Thank you. Minister. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member for the question. Uh, the member knows that there are 21 uh, children treatment centres here in the province of Ontario. 20 are funded by uh, the Ministry of Children member and Youth Services to, uh, to provide. The member from Beaches East York's not helping his cause. He's now been told, regardless of where you sit. The member from Whitby Oshawa come to order. And the Chief Government Whip. Carry on. Mr. Speaker, this government is committed to making the investments uh, necessary to ensure that our children and youth here in the province of Ontario get the services they need. In fact, Mr. Speaker, when we're talking about children treatment centres, uh, the Ministry of Children and Youth invested uh, more than $500 million uh, into uh, special needs and to support families and children with special needs in 2016-2017. Mr. Speaker, um, we continue to make investments. There are three facilities that we've created in the last uh, few Thank you. years. New question, the member from Hamilton Mountain. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. We are joined today by members of the Ontario Autism Coalition, families whose lives continue to be dominated by stress, anxiety, frustration, and financial hardship. The new autism program is supposed to be launched in just two months, yet families still have no idea where they stand. As they try to plan for the future, many are being told that they should register their child for school now in case there is nothing else available. Families need to plan for the new school year, and they can't do it. Schools need to be prepared. When will your government be clear with families, families that the services they need will be there and allow them to plan for the future? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Youth Services. Mr. Speaker, I, um, I, I know that the member opposite was in the legislature last week when I uh, had the opportunity to make a statement, a ministerial statement on autism. I was very clear at that point, uh, Mr. Speaker, that uh, we're going to go uh, uh, forward uh, with some new options in June. I've been very interested and I'm waiting for the implementation committee to come back with some recommendations, but we want to go into a direct funding model. I am waiting for the implementation uh, committee to come back with some recommendations. But I've been very clear, we're, we're going to create 16,000 new spaces here in the province of Ontario. We've been very clear that we've made an historical half a billion dollar investment into supporting families with children with autism. We're, we opened up, Mr. Speaker, we opened up five more diagnostic hubs uh, here in the province of Ontario, yes, one sir. of which I visited last week, and we're diagnosing children earlier so they can get the treatment they deserve. Thank you. Supplementary, the member, member from London West. Thank you, Speaker. Again to the Acting Premier. The report released today by the Ontario Autism Coalition makes clear that the education system is failing students with autism and that the supports that are available to students vary widely across the province. It's no wonder, Speaker, this year 25 school boards received $8 million less in special education funding than the year before, and according to People for Education, 
9% of school boards are spending more on special education funding than they receive from the province. Speaker, when will this Liberal government accept its responsibility to provide the funding, training and resources that students with autism need to be successful at school, regardless of where they live in Ontario? Minister of Education. Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker. I want to um, thank the member for the opportunity to uh, address this question because one of the things that we do in our education system is to ensure that um, six months before a, a student, with, a child with autism, comes into our schools, that there's a transition team that meets together with the school boards, the families, uh, as well as um, any therapists that are, are supporting that child, Mr. Speaker, to develop a transition plan, Mr. Speaker, and to ensure that six months after. After uh, they are in school, that they are continuously uh, monitored and checked in. Mr. Speaker, we want to ensure that uh, students with autism receive the supports that they need, and we have 20,000 students with autism who are in our schools. Mr. Speaker, they are getting the much-needed support. Answer. I want to say to the member opposite, in your plan in 2014, Chair, there was please. no mention, no mention at all, Mr. Speaker, of education. There was no plan in place other than to cut $600 million out of yes, the sir, funding for education and health. Any question? The member from Davenport. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And my question is for the Minister of Education. The focus of this government has been on how to best prepare our students for this constantly changing and globally interconnected world. In the face of changing times, the students in my riding of Davenport and all across Ontario need a wider range of skills and knowledge to succeed. They'll also need to learn how to be resilient and adaptable in a world where the only constant is change, as they explore their future career opportunities in an increasingly complex job market. Speaker, through you to the minister, can you tell us more about what our government is doing to ensure that our students are equipped with the skills they need to succeed now and in the future? Thank you, Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker. I want to say thank you to the, my colleague, the member from Davenport. Uh, I was so proud to announce uh, the launch of a series of career pilots um, in, uh, in the riding of Davenport. Mr. Speaker, in fact, we were with students uh, who were participating in the Specialist High Skills major program on transportation, and I got to change a tire for the first time, Mr. Speaker. It was quite, uh, quite a great event. Mr. Speaker, as part of this new initiative, we are working with our great educators and partnering with them as researchers to explore new ways of learning, including teaching in uh, entrepreneurship, career and life planning, digital literacy, Mr. Speaker, and of course, financial literacy. And if I can say, Mr. Speaker, strengthening financial literacy is a priority for our students. It's a priority for us as a government, Answer. and we are moving forward with that. The Career Studies pilot projects are a step in the right direction as we Thank work you. together with our educators. Thank you, Minister. It was uh, truly a pleasure to participate in that announcement with you, and I know from Ontarians of all ages that they really value this initiative. I was actually back at St. Mary Catholic Academy last Friday and had an opportunity once again to speak to the staff and students from that school in my riding, and all are thrilled about this revamp to the curriculum. As a parent, I'm pleased to hear that we are providing additional tools to our students to make informed decisions about how to plan for the financial future. Minister, can you tell us more about what the collaborative work behind these pilot projects is all about? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As part of the pilot projects, the focus of the educators who are acting as researchers uh, will investigate new approaches to the course, Mr. Speaker, and we will be gathering that feedback from the, the educators as well as from the students. And it, uh, it will allow us to acquire the skills and the knowledge uh, that we need to refresh our career studies course in grade 10, ensuring that students receive um, the education for the new global economy. It ensures that they have focuses on critical thinking, communication, collaboration, creativity, collaboration. and entrepreneurship. And these pilots are a great opportunity for our government to work closely with our educators as Finish, please.
Thank you, Speaker. Um, and the feedback from these pilots will be instrumental Answer. in informing what the course could become. I also want to mention that Prakash from the Toronto Youth Cabinet and yes. his team have talked to us about enhancing Thank financial you. literacy, and we're doing just that. New question. The member from York Central. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And my question is for the Minister of Education. A report from the Ontario Association for Behavioural Analysis recently called for action on autism support. In fact, it found the province and the child would benefit from treatment as the long-term benefits outweigh immediate costs, not to mention it's just the right thing to do. In fact, the report noted early help can save up to $3.7 million over a person's lifetime, and proper treatment would make for a more independent person. Mr. Speaker, will the minister heed this advice and give children the support they need? Where is the support? Thank you. Minister of Education. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, our top priority is ensuring the success and the well-being of all st our students, including students with autism spectrum disorder. Over the past decade, Mr. Speaker, we've invested $77 million to strengthen school capacity and improving the learning environment for students with autism. Very and that, important. of course, includes training and hiring professionals with expertise in applied behavior analysis to assist principals and teachers and transition teams in supporting students with autism. Mr. Speaker, I want to let this House know that the training of thousands of teachers every year is happening. In fact, we have trained more than 30,000 educators in ABA so that students National with autism and all students, in fact, can benefit from this um, expertise within the classroom. We're working closely with school boards and the Ministry of Children and Youth Services and their agencies and coalitions of parents and students to make sure we strengthen our support for students with autism. Minister, right now there are more than 21,000 children on wait lists for therapy in Ontario. That's more than the number of children who are receiving it. How long will these children languish on wait lists? Minister. Minister of Children and Youth Services. Minister of Children and Youth Services. People in this legislature need to understand that uh, there's been a huge transition when it comes to working with uh, young people with autism here in the province of Ontario. When we came into uh, government, there's about a thousand uh, young people who are receiving autism services here in the That's province enough. of Ontario. That number today is around 12,000. So we've seen a drastic increase. And yes, the wait list is increasing, and that's because there is more demand. Mr. Speaker, a decade ago, it was one in maybe uh, one in a, uh, 268 young people who are diagnosed with autism. Today, in southern Ontario, it's, it's one in around 65. Wow. So we're seeing a, a, a drastic change take place here in the province of Ontario, and we are allocating the right resources and changing the system yes, based on the demand. I would hope that the members opposite would look at our plan, yeah. um, and I know that they do not have a plan, but look at our plan and, um, and, and realize that this is a, a way forward. Thank you. Your question, the member from Algoma, Manitoba. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Premier. New research published Monday shows people in Northern Ontario face nearly double the level of cardiovascular health issues than residents around the GTA. How can we explain that, Mr. Speaker? This should be a wake-up call to this government. Two regions of Northern Ontario, including my riding of Algoma, Manitoulin, have some of the lowest health outcomes for cardiovascular health in the province. So, a father in my neighbourhood is twice as likely to suffer a heart attack as a father in Southern Ontario communities. I think we all understand that's not acceptable. When will this Liberal government go beyond broken promises and invest in health care for Northern people? Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, this government uh, knows and believes and understands just how important it is to provide the highest quality care to people in this province, regardless of where they reside. And, uh, Mr. Speaker, that's why we've continued to make important investments uh, in uh, all parts of this province, including in the north. In fact, with regards to cardiac care, I was so pleased to be able to announce uh, in Thunder Bay in June of 2015, we announced our support to develop a cardiovascular 
cardiovascular program for patients in northwestern Ontario. And the two local MPPs were instrumental, Mr. Speaker, in Thunder Bay and the Thunder Bay region uh, to, to enable that to happen. Yes, so sir. Thunder Bay is expanding its cardiovascular services program, not just for vascular, but also cardiovascular. And in fact, the vascular late last year it got up and running, and we're looking forward to the cardiac Thank surgery you. in the near future. The member from Hamilton Mountain on a point of order. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to, with your indulgence, uh, welcome some guests to the House from the Ontario Autism Coalition. We have Laura Kirby, McIntosh, Bruce McIntosh, Cliff McIntosh, and his service dog, Basil, Deacon uh, McIntosh, Karen Bochi, Melanie Cooper, Jennifer Taylor, Kristen Ellison, and Georgina Sarantopoulos. Thank you for your indulgence. Welcome to the start. Minister of Education, point of, point of order, Speaker. Um, I was uh, trying to acknowledge the member from Etobicoke Centre this morning for the announcement at Silver Creek, and I instead I had said the member from Etobicoke Lakeshore. Thank you. So I just wanted to correct my record, Mr. Speaker. Member so has thank the you right to correct the record. The member from London West on a point of order. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I would also like to welcome Elspeth Dodman from the Ontario Autism Coalition, also a member of the Youth Advisory Committee for the Provincial Advocate on Children and Youth, and a recipient this year of the London West Leading Women, Leading Girls Award. <laughs> Minister of Education, and point of order. I just uh, noticed in the members' East gallery that Janet Kers Kasper, Kersky is is here in the in the house, and I believe is that Dr. Roy that's there as well with her. So I'd like Thank to you. welcome them, and he is from my riding of Scarborough Guildwood. I beg to inform the House that, pursuant to Standing Order 98C, a change has been made in the order of precedence in the ballot list private members' public business, such that Mr. Cho uh, assumes ballot item number 53 and Mr. Hardiman assumes uh, ballot item number 55. We have a deferred vote on the motion of closure on the motion of second reading of Bill 87. Calling the members, this will be a five-minute bill.
All members, please take your seats. On March 27, 2017, Mr. Hoskins moved second reading of Bill 87, an act to implement health measures and measures related to seniors by enacting, amending, and repealing various statutes. Mr. Flynn has moved that the question be now put. All those in favour of Mr. Flynn's motion, please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Sandals. Mr. Sandals. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Duga. Mr. Duga. Mr. Mr. McCharles. Mr. McCharles. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Leo. Mr. Leo. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Tebow. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Codry. Mr. Codry. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Mrs. Mangas. Mrs. Mangas. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Domerle. Ms. Domerle. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jass. Ms. Jass. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mrs. Albanese. Mrs. Albanese. Mr. McMahon. Mr. McMahon. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Naidu Harris. Mr. Naidu Harris. Mr. Wong. Mr. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Milch. Mr. Milch. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Madame de Rosier. Madame de Rosier. All those opposed, please rise one at a time to be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Ms. McLeod. Ms. McLeod. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Yakubuski. Mr. Yakubuski. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Miller Perry Samuskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Samuskoka. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Mr. Scott. Mr. Scott. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Urick. Mr. Urick. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Ostroff. Mr. Ostroff. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettit. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. Monsieur Bisson. Monsieur Bisson. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Tabin. Mr. Tabin. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Mr. Monta. Mr. Monta. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. The ayes are 52, the nays are 44. The ayes being 52 and the nays being 44, I declare the motion carried. Mr. Hoskins has moved second reading of Bill 87, an act to implement measures and measures relating to seniors by enacting, amending, and repealing various statutes. Is it the pleasure of the House motion carried? I heard a no. All those in favor, please say aye. All those opposed, uh, please say nay. In my opinion, the ayes have it. Carried. Second reading of the bill. Does the election do for de Loire? There being no deferred votes, this house stands. Oh, sorry. Sorry. The minister. Minister. I ask that the bill be referred to the Standing Committee on Legislative Assembly. So moved. There are no further deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon.